Okay, so children can go with her. All right. Okay, brother, come on up and... Thank you, Pastor. Yes, make yourself at home, brother. Oh, okay. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Glad to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, thank you all for your hospitality to um, Tom and Charity and the, and the kids. We love them, and uh, they, they actually represented uh, Yehovah. They represented your church quite well when they were there at Line of Judah. So um, they asked us to come, and I appreciate Pastor Mike. And well, no, where's your wife? Okay, you didn't point your wife out, so I didn't know. <laughs> you just said my wife, so I was like, well, I don't know which one it could be. Well, thank you all for having us here. So um, I'm, I'm from Lana Judah Ministries. We uh, started a church. I actually founded the church about 30, what was it, 33? Is it 33 or 34 years ago? I've been there uh, ever since. I was brought up Church of the Brethren. Anyone know Church of the Brethren? I was brought up Church of the Brethren and uh, got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 13 um, at a Jimmy Swaggart meeting. And so... Uh, my Church of the Brethren moments changed and shifted slightly because Church of the Brethren is not necessarily Pentecostal. And uh, so I was called to preach at 13, filled with the Holy Spirit at 13, called to preach at 13, and I began my journey <coughs> to really fulfill the will of God. And um, uh, at, at 18, 19, I started having some evangelistic work, and at uh, 19, I was a youth pastor at Assemblies of God. And then at age 20, I started preaching at Assemblies of God in North Carolina. So, Inglehard, North Carolina, which is uh, along the sound of the beach, you know, Outer Banks. Uh, I wasn't, we weren't allowed to go to the Outer Banks. We had to stay in, inland. So, <clears throat> I was there for a while and then uh, moved to Virginia to an Assembly of God church. And things shifted a little bit for me there. And um, I became independent and um, uh, was preaching a typical Christian Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Here we go. And was having a good old time with, uh, with God. And I was uh, invited to preach at a Seventh-day Adventist church every Sunday, uh, every Saturday, excuse me. And so I would go to the, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist, and I had preached there for 20 years. And every time I would go there on a Saturday, they'd say, you know, Sabbath is Saturday. And I'd say, amen. And then I would preach, and then I'd go back to my Sunday church because I was just appeasing you because you were just saying it. And I was like, that's, that's good. Amen. <laughs> And uh, they said it to me like every single week. But I, you know, I'm a, <coughs> I'm a very mature guy, so I just kept saying amen uh, and went right across the street to my church and had Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night church. And about 10 years ago, uh, again, I was there. I'd, we've had this working relationship. And uh, they said to me, Saturday is Sabbath, you know. And I said, Amen. But for some reason, at that moment, it just pricked me. And I was like, you know what? Even though I'm very kind to you right now and very understanding to you right now, in my heart, I said, I'm going to go home. And I am going to study. Because I want to make sure when you say that to me again, instead of being nice, I'm going to say, well, let's just look at the Word. <laughs> so I began to study. And what I decided to do, for some reason, was is to <clears throat> study it during the week. But I also wanted to involve my church. So on Wednesday night, we would study the Sabbath. Well, nine months later, after my church was saved and unsaved and happy and sad, <laughs> because the more we studied, the more they wouldn't look at me, um, I did a whole, I just said, listen, I came before the congregation after a year of study and said, listen, I now know some truth that I never knew before. And I said, what I have taught you, I certainly a lot was truth, and I said, but now I must apologize for some of the things that I taught you that were not correct. I said, so I take that upon myself. And I said, but you know me, and that now that I know this truth, I cannot turn around and go opposite direction. So I said to them, <clears throat> I understand if you need to leave because we're about ready to do a major shift here. And I said, we're going to change from Sunday to Saturday. We're going to change from some... Uh, holidays that we used to do to some holidays that we don't know anything about. And um, I said, you are more than welcome. I understand as a pastor who loves you, who's been with you for 20 some years, and some of them have been with me for 20 some years. I said, I release you because I don't know what else to do for you because I can't get behind the pulpit and continue my journey in the way that I was. <clears throat> so 
we set a time, it was like June, we set a time for September. I even gave him a time. I said, so it's now June, September's rolling around, September, Labor Day, weekend, woo, we're switching. And uh, so we did. And uh, during that transition, we lost just one family. Um, the rest of them stayed. But it was, it was quite rough during those Wednesday nights. My wife usually would sit on this side, and um, <coughs> she uh, wouldn't look at me as I was teaching. <laughs> usually I'd look at my wife, and she's a, you know, a good feed of whether what I said was understood or not. You know, uh, if I look, and she's like, mm, like what? I was like, okay, I, I need to kind of <laughs> say this a different way. But when I look at her, she's like this. And then, you know, like wiping her brow and folding her hands. And I'm like, wow. <clears throat> so when I got home during those weeks, she would say to me, don't talk to me. I need at least 45 minutes to an hour. Then I'll come back to you so that we can talk. And so I just gave her the time. And uh, she would come back, and we would talk through it. And, you know, then I was never saved. And I said, yes, you were saved. And I never had a relationship. Yes, you did have a relationship. <clears throat> so... It was funny because, you know, usually at the end of church, everyone's just hugging, you know, see you later, see you at Sabbath. And during that period of time, it was like everyone just walked out like they were in depressed mode. <laughs> but I give it to them because they would come back again and again and again and again. And what we found was uh, people begin to understand because it, it's, it's, a, it's a jolt. It's really hard to at first to get it. And I told them, <clears throat> I am not a Christmas police. I am not... Uh, a Christmas tree police. I, you know, what I said to them was this. I said, we will worship the way that we've been teaching now for the last year, corporately. This is how it has to happen because I'm the leader of this house. Individually in my house, this is how we're going to live as far as me and my house. But as far as you, you must come and take your time, move your halakha the way that you need to move it. I am not going to drive by and stare in your window, <coughs> spit um, to, to bring, a, you know, something on you. And we will not make you feel bad, you know. And so, um, you know, some still, you know, maintain. They were quite sure that they weren't going to say anything. You know, you could see them like whisper. You know. But um, what I found was because of that, over time, even the ones that were strongholds melted. And they begin to change. But I gave them time because what I was saying is this is truth. And truth sometimes you have to live with. And you have to let it settle. And you have to let it <clears throat> change your heart. And I'm here to deliver you truth. I'm not here to make you live it. I'm here to deliver it. And my responsibility is. And I remember just one, I was telling uh, some brothers, this one time we, uh, during this transition, it, was, it happened to be Christmas. And I said, okay, let's just put the Christmas trees up because we have a fairly large altar and you know, we have like 10 foot, 12 foot trees and, you know, green meaning everlasting life and lights meaning, the, you know, reflection and all those things. And, and so I said, you we're in transition. Just go ahead and put them up. And I remember coming uh, from the back into the altar. And as soon as I opened that door and hit that altar, the, the grieving within me, I couldn't, it, it just, it just struck me. And I maintained myself, but I could just heard the, you know, him say to me, this is not happening. So I went to the altar and preached in front of the trees so I couldn't look at them. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> in the afternoon, I called uh, some people who had put the trees up, and I said, hello. And they said, we already know. <laughs> and I said, what? They said, they'll be down by tonight because we, st <laughs> we still hadn't made our transition to Saturday. <clears throat> so... What was hilarious was, is the, you know, the congregations there on Sunday morning, the trees and everything is wonderful and lit and everything. And then you come back Sunday night, it's like, <laughs> bare. And uh, so it's been quite a journey for us. So <clears throat> over now 10 years, we've been serving Yehovah through uh, living the Torah and, and uh, changing and shifting. And we're constantly changing and shifting because I've arrived to the point and understanding since I've got into the Torah, that I still don't know the whole thing. As a contemporary Christian preacher, I thought once I got to that level, I knew pretty well everything. Uh, but the Torah has opened my eyes to realize my halakha is every day. And so <clears throat> I just enjoy the journey. My wife now, who still loves me, 
uh, enjoys the journey. And one of the most exciting things for our life is, especially with our grandchildren, is that our grandchildren really only know Hora. And that's been one of the greatest moments of our lives. You know, we have to shift with our children and go back and say, that's not right. And I, I pray that on I that our children have shifted, but to, to know that you're raising the grandchildren up and they don't know anything other than, than Torah, that excites me. That excites me as a preacher. That excites me as a <coughs> pastor. They'll still say, do I call you pastor? Do I call you rabbi? Do I call? And I say, I don't care. Call me something. But it doesn't really matter. So we're just, we're just I, I'm encouraged to be here. Because a lot of times in our journey, especially at Line of Judah, it was like Yehovah just picked me out and started sharing stuff with me. And it wasn't on the move of someone else. You know how sometimes someone else is moving, someone else is saying, and you kind of hook onto someone, and then you're <clears throat> following them. It was like me alone just trying to prove this little Seventh-day Adventist church to leave me alone. And all of a sudden it formed, and I would be in the teaching. And then when I started seeking, was there anyone else? You know, because it, it kind of works with your brain a little bit. You know, like you're the only one, or really, you're the only one God's speaking to. <clears throat> and then I realized as we opened up, wow, there's another pocket of people. There's another pocket of people. And I, we've just seen the move of God uh, opening the eyes of people, but also reaffirming and affirming that this is what I'm doing in this last day. Restoring, restoring, restoring back his people to the truth. So I'm standing before you tonight, uh, today <clears throat> just to um, share with you some truth. I'm a very short-winded preacher. Three hours max is what I usually <laughs> preach. And um, Tom guaranteed me. Charity said, no problem. Six, seven, is that right? Okay, just checking. <clears throat> and, and that he said uh, that if you want to leave, uh, you can't. <laughs> Church law says no. And if you need to, I can show you in Torah. After the service, not right now, <clears throat> but after the service. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 13, 5, uh, someone usually does my PowerPoint. I gave it to them. They said, do you want the clicker? And I don't really want the clicker <clears throat> because I end up going past nine slides, and then I'm trying to figure out where I'm at. So they'll, they'll do their best, and I'll do my best. I'll keep going, and hopefully we'll match up the slides. Amen? <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 13, 5. In the Torah portion, <clears throat> the, the Torah portion C, um, I like to go through the Torah portion, and, and I like to... Just, you know, look at it and pray and let the Ruach just kind of get something for me and hit something for me. So we don't necessarily go through the Torah portion, but I do take a portion and say, you know, what do you want, Ruach, this morning? And so I was, I was praying because, you know, you're a new church to me, you're a Kahila, Kahol, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, I wanted the face of God. I really wanted you to have a message that I felt was for you. Um, and so when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 5, it says, You are to follow Jehovah your God, fear him, obey his mitzvah, listen to what he says, serve him, and cling to him. And as I was looking at this, there is nothing really more pivotal <clears throat> in our walk with Jehovah than understanding who we are and understanding our true identity, which is one of the blessings of coming into Torah because now I know who I am and I know my true identity. <clears throat> when I looked at this verse and understood what it was saying, uh, you know, pastor was telling me, you know, the, the, the worship, I don't know who, what was your name? You were the one singing? About uh, Yehovah walking among us, and then the vision about a man walking. And he had, uh, you know, asked me what my title was, and so my title actually this morning is Water Walkers. To be a water walker. And so the whole thing is based on Yehovah walking among us. So I know that if it's in the music and I know if it's in the vision, then I know it's, I hit the mark, right? <clears throat> so then I want you to understand that what I'm saying to you is not something that I just go through and try to make up. It's something that the Ruach really wants you to understand because he brought it through the worship. He brings it through a vision. And now he's bringing it through the word. So we need to understand what he wants us to understand when it comes to him walking. You know, we are too often, we, we forget that we have been adopted into the family of an almighty Yehovah an almighty God. You know, we, we're not just someone shabby that just has been chosen for accidental. He looked in our lives from beginning to end, from end to back to the beginning, and chose you. You sit here as chosen people. Amen. You sit here as one who God looked at and said, listen, I want you. I want you. In every <clears throat> flaw that you have, I still want you. In every act of sin that you've ever done or have or doing or maybe will do, I still really want you. And I've chosen you.
And we forget or kind of fail to believe that we have been made sons and daughters. So you don't sit here as just people. You are a son and a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <clears throat> and therefore, we have to live a lifestyle kind of within the character of, of, of our Father. Um, when we came to Torah and understanding Torah, I realized I had to change some character. I had to change some of my nature. I had to change some things the way I thought. As a, as a typical uh, <clears throat> Christian preacher, I would preach on Sunday morning and, and people would say amen. And then when they didn't show up on Sunday night, I was like, you're all going to hell because, you know, you said amen. And then you're not here on Sunday night. I don't get it, you know. And when I would preach and people would not respond in the way that I felt they should respond as someone who's been brought up in that typical tradition, it would just drive me crazy. I mean, I, I would have to work on my heart because my heart, you know, we're like within fine, Lord, you know, swallow up all these people. I mean, really, <clears throat> maybe not to that extreme, but really, you know, when you're preaching your heart out and you're seeking the Lord and you're giving a message and then people pretend they're responding, but they don't respond in action, it kind of ticks you off. I don't know whether you have that experience or not. <clears throat> and as I came into Torah and began to understand, then I realized it's not my job to look at you and make sure and check mark this and check mark that. And the more I came to the tour, the more I realized I'm here to proclaim a word. I'm here to tell you who you are. I'm here to tell you <clears throat> by the divine unction of the Ruach that you are sons and daughters. Now, what you do with that word, that's not on me. Amen. And I used to carry that weight, really used to carry that weight. And Torah has freed me. Amen. Not that I'm just, you know, <clears throat> oh, whatever, whatever. Uh, it's just that it has freed me from the frustration of pastorship and has caused me now to live my life in Torah and Halakha with such joy and such passion. And if I preach hard and no one responds or they feel that they, they say amen, but they don't follow through with it, not my problem. Not really not my problem. And so Moses here <clears throat> reminds us, uh, see, three hours, you have to have water for three hours. <laughs> Moses reminds us and reminds the children of Israel of their covenant relationship. So let me just encourage you that you have a covenant relationship and how this secures their identity. When we, when we understand the covenant, then it secures our identity, and then it prescribes a pattern for our lives. You know, God has given us a pattern for our life. In Deuteronomy 13, 5, we can look at that <clears throat> verse again, and what we find is we find six verbs, six verbs which teach us both who we are and therefore how we are to live. It, it would be redundant for me to tell you how to live if you don't know who you are. So you need to know who you are so that you can <clears throat> know how to live. So when we look at those verbs, go ahead and do the next slide. When we look at those verbs, that, those verbs in, in 13.5 says to follow, to fear, to keep, to listen, to serve, and to cling. That's who we are, and that's how we are to live. So we look at those six verbs, and <clears throat> you're blessed to, today because I'm not going to talk about six verbs. I just want you to see them. What I'm going to do is talk about the first verb. And the first verb, halach, which means to follow, which also means to walk. So we, ha we have the vision. We have the worship that tells us about he's walking among us. So let's look at this. After Yehovah, your Elohim, you shall walk. That's what the text actually literally says in Hebrew. After Yehovah, your Elohim, you shall walk, which means you're following him. How he walks is how you walk. Yeshua said this way in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him what? Deny himself and do what? Take up his execution stake and follow me. So there's something. Anyone wants to come after me, so there's a, there's a calling to walk after him, right? And then there's a standard after you start walking with him. <clears throat> what do you do? Then you kind of say no to yourself. So you have to want to walk. Then when you start walking, you say no to you. And then you pick up those things in your life that are not supposed to be there and you get rid of them, correct? And then what do you do? <clears throat> then you continue to keep following or you walk after him. The journey of Torah is not to make you feel bad. The, the journey of Torah is to open up this word and say, this is who he is. Now walk like him. This is what he wants you to do. Now do it. And he gives you allowance and mercy and grace because he knows you can't do it immediately. Amen. Right? <clears throat> I don't know which section is the perfect section. Uh, but or, or, or does any, is anyone here that can walk Torah out perfectly? No. Right. Three people said no. The rest of them are just waiting <laughs> to see where that's going to go. 
<clears throat> none of us, you're not committing to or not. You're just like, you're in limbo. Hello? <clears throat> Look what 1 Peter 2, 21 says. Indeed, this is what you were called to do. This is what you were called to do. You and I were called to do this. Vineyard was called to do this. Lion of Judah was called to do this. One of the most exciting things as I, as I did the journey of Torah, I started to go to Israel and I looked at and, and met a, um, <clears throat> an Orthodox Jewish person who does not know Yeshua. And we were talking and, you know, he's so very kind to uh, Christians, you know, some of them are not. And he was very kind. And, and I was telling him about my journey and, <clears throat> you know, some different things. And he was very intrigued. And so I said, you know, my church name. He said, what is your church name? I said, Lion of Judah Ministries. And he looked at me, which is one of the most profound things that I've ever heard. And he said, well, then this is where you would have to go. Because if that's what he told you to call yourself, then that means the name must manifest itself. So therefore, 30 some years ago, when you said and you thought in your brain, I think I'll call the church Lion of Judah Ministries. It was actually Yehovah saying, you will become like Lion of Judah. You will become like Yeshua, <clears throat> which means the journey, however long it was going to take, he was going to mold, he was going to change, he was going to shift, because the name says Lion of Judah. And if our name proclaims Lion of Judah, then we must take on the character Amen. of Lion of Judah. How would I know? I just thought it was a good name. <laughs> so it says, this is what you were called to do. Because the Messiah too suffered on your behalf, leaving an example so that you should what? Say that with me. Follow in his steps. Psalms 119, 133 says, Establish my footsteps in your word, and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Establish my footsteps. Walk, walk, walk after Yehovah. Walk the way Yehovah is, is walking. So to walk after Yehovah means to live as he would live, to view life as he would view it from his perspective. <clears throat> the greatest uh, thing in our life is that we stop looking through our own eyes and see it through his eyes. His perspective, how does he see things? How does he see this house? How does he see <clears throat> myself as a man, as a, as a father, as a husband? How does he see myself as a, as a preacher, as a teacher? And I need to begin to look at my life, both good and bad, and the mountains and the valleys, through his vision. And when I view from his perspective, then I'm actually going to make choices based on his leading. What gets us in trouble is that we see through our own perspective, then we make choices according to how our perspective sees it. And that's not following him. That's wanting to follow him, but following us. So this Torah portion is saying, listen, <clears throat> you, you need to get to the place where you want to follow him and create a halakha that's not your own, right? It's a halakha that is his for your life and will direct you and guide you. So <clears throat> we have to look at our journey. All of us are on a journey, right? Um, and for me and some of you, it has been an outrageous walk. It's been up, it's been down, it's been around. You know, right now for the last, uh, not to get into any details, but the last two and a half years, we've had a man attack us viciously, viciously over the internet. I never met the man, but he attacks us viciously. <clears throat> talks about us, talks how horrible we are. Never met the man. Talks, uh, I mean, vile things that I even are like, what in the world? He, he's even attached himself to one of our sites so that when people go to Line of Jew, they see him. I'm like, what is going on? And you know what? We're praying, oh Lord. You know, at first you're like, oh, merciful God, save him. Then you go through a path, oh, Lord, open up the earth and swallow him. <laughs> then you're like, oh, Lord, just downright kill him immediately. <clears throat> and you go through all these emotions, you know what I'm saying? The switching of the church, the changing of this, and, <clears throat> and how people are responding. And, you know, all these, it's been an outrageous walk. I'm sure for most of you, it's been an outrageous walk. Ups, downs, ins, outs, um, testings, trials, tribulations. Anyone have any of those? Or are you just mountaintop shouters? <laughs> and many times Jehovah asked us to walk a walk that at time might seem <clears throat> very impossible and very costly. You know, when he told me, I want you to switch the church. I mean, I, I was in faith and was believing him. I really didn't even, even know the cost of that. I wasn't even thinking about it. I just knew that, oh, I needed to do that. And I talked to someone who uh, was my first person to lead me to uh, <clears throat> take me to a tour on Israel. And he was like, wow. And I was like, wow, what? He was like, that's all. That was a big thing to do. And I was like, really, was it? I didn't understand the cost. <clears throat> but our lives have experienced costs. You know, family, uh, friends, especially now that you start speaking some truth and 
uh, moving away from some traditions, those people that were around you encourage you no longer. You know, I, I had someone from my past, a preacher <clears throat> when I was 13 called me, uh, uh, Jeff, I was like, hello, I haven't talked to you for like 20 years. Um, do you still believe in Jesus? I was like, well, well, yeah. Well, I was just wondering. Someone said they saw you and you were a Jew. I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? I said, yeah, I mean, I look back at my past and I looked at my family. I do have some Jewish roots, but I also have some Arab, Arab roots. So I argue with myself all the time. I'm not sure. Sometimes I'm Jewish. Sometimes I'm Arab. <clears throat> I also have Moroccan roots in me. So now I'm African. So I'm African and Jewish and Arab. I'm just all messed up. But the thing is, it was surprising <clears throat> that just to say I'm following in a different way, you know, do you still know? Ah, oh, yes. So you know that you're going to have friends that are going to call, you know, that, that life is going to cost you something. You're sitting here knowing that life is going to cost you something, the life of Halakha, the life of following after Yehoah, because if the Messiah suffered, then who are you? He's the son, right? And though you are son and daughter, <clears throat> you're going to suffer like him. So we find here that Yehoah, you know, walked in the cool of the day with creation. If you just go back to the word of God, you're going to find that word that he walked a lot. Yehoah walked in the cool of the day. Abraham took his son Isaac on the road to his own sacrifice. There was a walking that had to take place to get there. We know that Moses and the Israelites took a walk where a Red Sea stood, right? <clears throat> it would have been nice to say, I'm taking you out of Egypt. What flight am I going in? Jet blue, Delta, what? No, you're going to have to walk through this wilderness, right? And walk through some things in your life. And it's going to be a frustrating wilderness, but it's yet it's going to be an adventure. You know, when you all were excited, I'm going to Sukkot, I'm going to camp. You know, I was like, oh, nice. Because I'm not a camper unless there's like a Hilton or, <clears throat> you know, I'll camp with you there. You know what I'm saying? So you all were like, yeah, ooh, I'm going. I was like, ooh, yeah, you go. You, <laughs> Luke, go. Oh, I need to look at the, I need a Torah. I need, a to I need a, a revelation of the word Torah about camping. <clears throat> so, you know, it will be a treat for some of you. Uh, for me and my wife, it would not be a treat, especially for my wife. She'd be like, what? Camping? I don't think so. So when we look at the wilderness, they left a generation behind. You know what I'm saying? Everyone was supposed to get there, but they left a generation behind. Joshua's triumph walk around Jericho, just blow the horn. No, you've got to walk around a couple times and then do it again and then do it again and do it again. The disciples <clears throat> illuminating walk to Emmaus, you know, and not until they walked did they have a revelation of Yeshua. Uh, Paul's interrupted walk to Damascus. You know, he's on his way and get kicked off a horse. And we just see all these things. And then we have Yeshua's walk of sorrow to, to Calvary, to Golgotha. So we look at this word walk. It has a lot of implication, has a lot of power behind it. <clears throat> but one of the most unforgettable walks of all, and we all know it because it's Peter. Peter in the boat and Yeshua comes. And what does Peter do? He says, uh, if you're who you are, then tell me to come out. And so it's not so much where he was in Peter's life, but what he was walking on and who he was walking with. So I want to look at this as we connect Deuteronomy 13 to Peter's life, because <clears throat> everything in the Torah has relevance to our own life. Correct? It doesn't stand on, it does stand by itself to that day. It also has more power in our own lives because that's where we're living right now. So if I would stop and ask, if I'm going to ask you, <clears throat> um, who wants to step out in faith? Now, I always tell my congregation, don't raise your hand until you think about it. But who would like to step out in faith? Something in your life, an area in your life, something that maybe you wanted to do, haven't done, or you just find yourself just kind of sitting in a place and you would like to step out in faith. You know, <clears throat> when, when the pastor says raise your hand, you just want to be able to raise your hand. When, when it's time to worship, you want to be able to worship. You want to be able to just step out in faith. You need to ask yourself that question. Am I willing to step out in faith? Or if I would ask you, who wants to experience something more of the power and presence of Yehovah? You want more of him. <clears throat> you know, you had this level and you want, you want overflowing level. You want, you, you want that you can't stand level. You know, all of us stood and then we decided to kneel and pray. But wouldn't you just like to stand and then you just overcome? You just can't. There, there's just no control, you know. And that power and, and presence of him sweeping over us. When we look at Peter's life, we can say, how many would like to ever walk on water? And then the pastor was telling me about his, his child wanting to walk on water. I want to be there, okay? 
<clears throat> so when you feel the unction, just call me, but give me a couple hours. It's about five hours from where I live. So look at, look at Peter's life, and the easy thing is to say, well, how does he walk on water? Well, of course he can walk on water because Yeshua was there, right? But how many were in the boat? There was 12 in the boat. How many walked on water? One. So it's not because his presence was there, because if that's the case, he would have floated everybody up out of the boat. And <clears throat> they would have had a, you know, walking on water party, but they didn't. There was 11 of them stuck in a boat, and one decided to get out at the what? At the calling, at the leading, <clears throat> because who's walking on water? He is. And if I want to be a water walker, then I got to do what he does. And if he's walking on water, then let me get out. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> if, he, if he's going to heal the sick, then let me heal the sick. If he's going to raise the dead, then let me raise the dead. Wherever he goes, I'm going to go. So wherever he's at, I'm going to follow. So that's the power of a holocaust. The holocaust is not making a choice. Should I? Should I not? Do I want to? Do I not want to? The power of it is if he can walk and he's walking and he's going to the other side, then why am I in this boat? Amen. Why am I in the boat? <clears throat> there is a consistent pattern in Scripture. And I went through a couple things. You know, this is walking, this is walking, he is walking. And so this consistent pattern in Scripture of what happens in a life that Yehovah wants to use and improve. There is a pattern. Here is the pattern. <clears throat> there is always a call. How many feel you have a call in your life? Raise it up or keep it down. Don't, I don't know. Could be, could not be, not quite sure. Today, maybe, not tomorrow. Sukkot, no. <clears throat> There's a call. We all have a call in our lives, right? Many are called, few are chosen. It's not that he said, oh, I do want you and I don't want you. The chosen is those who are willing to follow the lead. Everyone's called. <clears throat> but the chosen is not because he chose you. The chosen is because you've chosen to answer the call. And you've chosen to get out of the lousy boat, the boat that's been laying there, the boat that's been sitting there in the water. So he asked ordinary people to engage in an act of extraordinary trust. You know, for 20 years, I kept hearing, Saturday is Sabbath. Mm, it's nice. It's nice you have Saturday. It's nice I have Sunday. Oy vey. Who would have thought? <laughs> but then, when he pricks your heart, and I see him walking. See, I didn't know it was true until I saw him walking. I saw him walking. And when I saw him walking, then I had to follow. And when I had to follow, he's asking me to engage in an act of extraordinary trust. I have to trust him. He'll secure my congregation. I have to trust him. None will be lost. I have to trust him that everything is going to be okay. Right? Because it doesn't always happen that easily. <clears throat> some pastors could change their church and lose everybody. You have to have some extraordinary trust. And whether you want to believe it or not, when, you have a, when you're a, a pastor and you have a church and you've had a church for a very long time and that is your salary, salary is very real. Everybody's like, salary? What salary? Salary is very real. <clears throat> yes, you don't focus on money, but money is very real. Who's going to pay the light bill? Who's going to keep my children warm? Who's going to keep my wife cold because she likes air conditioning? What's going to happen, Right? extraordinary trust. I want you to do something that you don't know. I want you to do something. I want you to get out of your boat. Because for 20 years, you've been in your boat, and you've just been, woo, it's nice. This is nice. This is nice. And Yeshua's walking by saying, hello, it's time to do something. The second thing is there's always fear. <laughs> no, God has given me not a spirit of fear, but if I, yes, but there is fear. Okay? Don't deny what you feel. <clears throat> just know where to place it. Right? There's always a fear. I love a uh, super spiritual person. I, I don't fear. I trust God. Be careful what you say. Because there's something around the corner that's going to make you scared. And Yehovah seems to ask us to do things that are scary to us. So go, that's scary. <laughs> and you have this kind of fear of inadequacy, right? <clears throat> I can't speak. I, I can't talk. I can't do this. But it, you might not seem like it right now, but I'm actually a very introverted person. I don't... I don't really engage. I try to engage, you know, and I, we were at the, Wendy's coming here and a, a man was in front of me and he started talking to me and I started talking. And after we sat down, I'm talking, he said, you never talk to people like that. I was like, I don't know. He was just talking, so I was talking. I'm a kind of a quiet person, actually, in reality. Okay? Peskenny's not. He'll talk your ear off. <laughs> My wife is not. She'll talk and talk. And I'll just sit there. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. But when I get behind a pulpit, it's a little bit different. I can speak a little bit. I, 
you know, I'm not afraid. But there's a fear of inadequacy, a fear of, of <clears throat> not, you know, Moses said, I'm slow to speak, don't know if I can do this thing, right? I, I, my, my tongue is slow, and yet Jehovah's choosing you. He's asking you, <clears throat> giving you a call at a burning bush, and then he wants you to face your fear. He's, he knows what you can't do, right? Aren't you glad he doesn't call you on what you can do? Because none of us would do anything. He's asking us to do something. There's, there's a fear of failure always. You know, it seems like giants are in that land and we're just little grasshoppers to them. <clears throat> Again, fear of inadequacy, fear of failure, a fear of Yehoah. You remember the, the, the man when he said, why didn't you do this? Well, I know you're a hard man seeking where you reap and sow, and so I didn't do nothing with it. Fear. So we have this, we always know there's a call in our life, and there's always going to be fear with that call, correct? And <clears throat> the thing that we have to realize, though, is that there's always going to be assurance. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Even if he asks us to go through the valley of the shadow of death, what? He's there, right? I'm always encouraged, and I don't understand people, you know, they're always praying, get me out. But he never said, if you go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll get you out. What he says is, while you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? I'll walk with you. Well, thanks. I'd prefer to get out. <clears throat> and he says what? Fear no. Fear no evil. Don't fear this. Listen, you're in a boat. But I'm walking now. <clears throat> if I was in the boat and you were in the boat, you're doing okay. But if I'm walking on the water and you're still in the boat, we have a problem. And the problem is that you're supposed to halakha. You're supposed to follow me. And if I'm your rabbi, I'm your master, I am the king of kings and lord of lords, and you see me walk on the water, all 12 of you should have raised up <clears throat> in that boat and said, well, what are we doing in this boat? Let's start walking. He promises his presence. And because there's assurance, then there's always a decision. Whose decision is it? Mine and yours. Again, how many in the boat? And how many got out? One. Did they all have the same decision? Yes, they could have got up. They could have walked out. Just because Peter said, you know, if, if you're the son of God, let me walk on the water, fine, come on out. Uh, the rest of them could have jumped out too. <clears throat> He's not restricting them. The, the, the Ruach's not like, no, not you. He's only called that one. You all sit still. No. We all could be water walkers if we want to. Or we can just uh, kind of chill in a boat wait till we get to the other side you know as a person that we have decisions some of us say yes some of us say no and then there's some people <clears throat> that believe they just don't decide they just wait i'm going to wait it out and however the lord leads and but it's a really a yes or, or no situation and you sitting here today as vineyard people must decide is it yes or is it no and in that <clears throat> there's always a changed life so that's the sequence you get a call there's always going to be fear, but you're going to have assurance. Then there's going to have to be a decision in your life. And then after the decision, guess what's going to happen? It's going to change your life. How many want to change life? I'm not satisfied with my life. I, I'm not satisfied. <clears throat> my best sermon, I'm still not satisfied. The biggest shout I can give, I'm still not satisfied. I want more. I want to go higher with him. I want him to reveal more things to me and do greater things in my life. <clears throat> not for me that you can look at me and say wow so I can testify well let me just tell you what the Lord has done but because I want to follow him and I know he's an extraordinary <clears throat> God he's an extraordinary father who loves me so much that he's not willing just to sit in a boat with me but he wants me to experience something that I've never ever experienced before and he wants my life to be changed and I want my life to be changed perfect life no but learning growing so that I can follow him in every area that he calls me out. So we look at Matthew chapter 14, 25 through 32. <clears throat> Around 4 o'clock in the morning, he came toward them walking on the lake. Now, if we just remember in the, in, in the story, I might have the uh, scripture up later. But who put him in the boat and told him to get in the boat and told him to go to the other side? He did. Now, hold on. Wouldn't he know that there's a storm? What kind of God is this to put us in a boat when he knows there's a storm? <clears throat> so around 4 o'clock in the morning, he came toward them walking on the lake. When the Talmudim saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Terrified. Now let's just stop for a moment and realize, maybe 
the way that we see God sometimes and what he expects of us terrifies us. Maybe we could even say, if that is God and he's walking on the water, is he asking us to walk on the water? Is he asking us to drink of his blood and eat of his body? Is he asking us to give our lives? So the, the being terrified is that <clears throat> maybe it is him, and I'm terrified that it is him because now he's doing something extraordinary that he might ask me to do. I'd rather him just kind of be cool, calm, collected. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. Good to be here. Shabbat shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. And then I go home, right? And I do my life, and I come back, whatever. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. And then I go home, right? Get in my little boat. Head on home, do my little life. You do your life, I'll do mine. We come together, <clears throat> have a powerful worship. Amen. Did, was that worship good? That worship was rocking. Baruch. But then I go home, get in my boat, and go home. So am I terrified that I don't know who he is, or am I terrified that it is him? And he might ask me to do something that's extraordinary, that's going to cause a call to be placed on my life, which is going to cause fear to come up. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they scream with what? Fear. But at once Yeshua spoke to them. Courage, he said, it is I. Stop being afraid. I can see it sometimes. Stop. Then Peter, Kepha, called to him, Lord, if it really is you, tell me to come to you on the water. And what does he say? He says, now, I want you to pray about it first, Peter, and make sure it's the leading of the Ruach. I don't want to ask you to do anything that you cannot handle at this moment. So maybe we'll just do some fasting and prayer. It's about another 10 minutes, another 15 minutes across. Maybe in five more minutes I'll ask you because I really want you to be sure. Let's set a fleece up. Let's ask that something <laughs> happens. Let's ask that the other 11, let's all pray right now. Maybe we'll have some, uh, some agreement. Amen. Let's pray. Grab hands, people. No, <clears throat> he says what? You want to do it? Come. You want to do it? Come. We have to understand that if our steps are ordered by the Lord, then a lot of things that come in our lives are, are what he wants us to do. Why are you praying about it? Why are you seeking him about it? What's, what, what does your decision have to do? <clears throat> the decision why you decide to seek him, and I'm not saying in all things, but a lot of things, the reason why we want to pray and seek and, and make sure it's him is because we don't want to do it. So anyone that can give us a, you know, you okay not to do it, then I'm with you, right? Because we hate those people. Just jump out. Come on, let's go. Go. <clears throat> Stop being afraid. Then Kepha called, come. And so what did Peter do? What did he do? He got out of the boat and he what? <clears throat> Walked on water toward Yeshua. He didn't just get out and touch his toe. He didn't get out and just stand there. He walked on water toward Yeshua. But here's what we focus on. And then the wind came. Then the waves came. And he said, Lord, save me. And he began to sink. And Yeshua immediately stretched out his hand, took hold of him and said to him, such little trust, why do you doubt? And as they went up into the boat, the wind ceased. But he did get out. See, water walkers recognize Jehovah's presence. If he didn't recognize who he was, he would never got out of the boat. I'm not getting out of the boat when, if Matthew uh, says to me, come on out. I'm, I'm not getting out because you said so. But I'll get out because he said so. I know he can walk on water. I don't know what's happening with you. Are you on a stone? Are you on a rock? Are you tricking me? <clears throat> I know you can walk on water, Yehovah. So I will do what you want me to do. <clears throat> I will accept the call even through my fear. I will accept the call. And the, and the story here is that when they got in the boat, there was a storm that, that rose up. And so they're tormented by this, the storm. The waves are there, the violent storm. We all know the story. <clears throat> they, they just tried to keep it afloat. I mean, there's a horrific storm going on, and they're terrified that they're going to not make it across. And then they see a shadow. They don't recognize him. And we ask the question, how did they fail to recognize him? How in the world, when you spend this time with your master, do you fail to recognize him even though it's a shadow? How do you fail to recognize him? And the answer would be is that sometimes 
It takes eyes of faith to recognize when Yeshua is around, not your own eyes. You have to recognize it through the eyes of faith. And sometimes in the middle of our storm, tormented by waves of disappointment and doubt, we don't recognize the presence either. We don't know he's in the valley of the shadow of death. We didn't know that he was in the valley we just didn't know. We don't know that he's in the testing, the trial, and the tribulation. <clears throat> you know, last, uh, last Torah portion talks about uh, Yehoah brings them out of Egypt to what? To afflict them, to test them so that he would know their hearts. Well, if you would have told me that in the beginning, I might not have laughed. Oh, you told me I'm going to a promised land. Who doesn't want to sign up for a promised land? Come on. Then later on you say, to afflict you, to test you, to know your heart. That's a little deception. Here we have this walking on water, tormented by waves, disappointment, and they don't recognize them. Sometimes we don't either. In the, in the version within the Gospel of Mark, the Greek word is a technical term. <clears throat> I have it up here. And it, it really defines, it defines moments when Yehovah made an appearance to a select individual or a group for the purpose of communicating a message. Do you think I'm here by accident on oh, August 19th? Even when I was making a decision, 12th, 19th, what's good for you, what's good for me? Who already knew what decision would be made? He already knew what's going to happen today. He already knew what the word was going to be. He already knew who the vision was going to come. He already knew what the worship was going to be like. Who knew? Who knew? <clears throat> he did. And so it's a defining moment. This morning is a defining moment. Every time you come together as a, as a corporate body, it's a defining moment. It's a, it's a new word. It's a new revelation. It's what Yehovah wants. It's a defining moment when Yehovah makes an appearance to a select individual or a group. He's here today. He has selected us to be together. He selected this word for you, and he selected everything that has happened today to happen. He selected us coming down, what happened to us coming down. Uh, he selected who is preaching at my kahila. All that's been selected. It's a defining moment. It's not accidental. Was it accidental that he put him in a boat when, he, when there was a storm? Did he say, oh, wow, there's a storm. I better go see how they're going. No, he said, get in the boat. I'll be with you later. I could have gotten the boat with you, but I want you to experience the storm. Because in the middle of the storm, I need you to recognize me. Because you can recognize me without a storm. See, when there's no waves, you can see me. When everything is good, hallelujah, Baruch Hashem, I can recognize him. Isn't this sweet? Don't you recognize him? But when all hell breaks loose, do you recognize him? And the part of our life we have to understand is to follow him is not to follow him when all your life is good. It's to be able to follow him when your life is not so good. It's to be able to follow him when a storm is in your life. <clears throat> I can follow him if the signs are there. Follow me. Here I am. Hear the songs. Listen to the shofar. That's, I'm good. But when the storm is there and the waves are there and the thunder is there and, I, and my boat is rocking, will I recognize him? Will I be able to recognize him? And, and sometimes it's not because what am I focused on? The storm, situation, what's going on, and he could go right by me. <clears throat> you know, when we look at these defining moments, it's, it's Yehoah who puts Moses in the cleft of the rock. And the scripture says he did what? Passed by. The word of God says that he told Elijah to stand on the mountain, and then it says he passed by. He puts him in a boat, and then he what? Passes by. You come here today, and what does he do? He walks among us. He passes by. Some will respond, and some will not respond. <clears throat> some will respond because their focus is on him. And some of us, even though he's passing us by, will not recognize him because we're so in our heads and so in our heart and so in our situation and so in our troubles that we can't see beyond them. And yet he's there to heal you. We're so wrapped in pain and he's there as a healer, but we can't, we can't grab out and touch him as a healer because we're so focused on the pain. He's a deliverer, but we're so focused on our heart and what has happened in our heart and the pain and agony in our heart, but he's there to remove it, to take it from us. And all he's wanting, waiting for us to do is say, if that's you, call me. And he'll give you one simple word, come. And yes, you might get out and then <clears throat> you might fail, but... That's life, isn't it? But at least you got out because 11 people stayed in a boat. And what we do is that we focus on Peter failing. I preach that about failing, not having faith. Why didn't Peter have faith? Instead of focusing on, look what Peter did. He got out. And even when he changed his perspective and began to sink, 
Yeshua picks him up. He doesn't tell him, I can't believe you got out and sunk. He's just saying, listen, do you understand what you can do? I mean, didn't he say, if you just had a, 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 a mustard seed, you could say that mountain move and it would, it would be moved. And he's not saying you only have a mountain, but he's saying if you could just use that part, do you know what you could do? And each time they were afraid, but each time they said yes. Moses says yes. Elijah says yes. We, we can go down the line, and I'm, I'm sure I'm sitting with people who have said yes. So why tell them to get in the boat if there was going to be a storm coming? They would have to learn. And they're going to have to learn that obedience is not guaranteed of being spared adversity. I'm a living testimony. Oh, if I'm obedient, <coughs> you know, in this... Um, uh, uh, you know, greasy grace and sloppy agape. That he just wants to oil you up and everything's going to be wonderful and no harm shall come nigh you. You know what I'm saying? And I do know that there is a position where things can't come into our house, but we are not there yet. And what we do is we do open the door a lot of times to things and the enemy is allowed to come in. But yet sometimes we have to go back and read and it says that he afflicts and he tested and he wants to know what's going on in your heart. So I have to discern. I'm always just saying it's the devil. So I use every scripture I know. Greater is he that's in me than he's in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. In the name of Yeshua, put your hand in my face. <laughs> and what do I still do? I'm still battling that thing. <laughs> then I go through, doesn't God love me? What's going on? And he's like, are you serious? The storm had their full attention. Don't ever let the storm have your full attention. Listen, I'm not a person who says, don't, you know, you're not sick. You know, say it again. You're not sick. You're not sick. You're not sick. I am sick. <laughs> My head hurts. It doesn't hurt. It does hurt. No, it doesn't hurt. In Jesus' name, it doesn't hurt. It hurts. And what I want in Jesus' name to be gone. <laughs> but I can't lie and say it doesn't hurt. It hurts. Right? Don't think about it. What do you mean don't think about it? Pound, bound, bound, bound. He didn't say, ignore the storm. He said, know that I am with you in the storm and be able to handle the storm. That's where maturity comes in. <clears throat> yes, you have to fight the waves. Okay, but fight it. Yes, you have to fight the fear that says you're going to drown, but fight it. Because if I put you in the boat to go and I told you to go to the other side, you will make it to the other side because I do not lie. And what I'm raising up in the middle of the storm, I'm going to time myself so that in the middle of the storm, I come and meet 12 of my disciples, and they're going to recognize me or not recognize me. It depends. And when I get there, what I want them to understand is <clears throat> you can either ride the storm out in the boat or the safety that you think you have, or you can get out of the boat and walk with me. Choice is yours. Either way, you get to the other side, right? Just however you choose to get there. I want to be able to be able to walk, right? We all have divinely appointed, defining moments in our life where we have to trust. He still asks his followers to do extraordinary things. You sit here as extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, and don't think it's over because you've got some more extraordinary things, church, to do. And if you're not looking for him, you just might miss him. One of the saddest things is it's a missing. I don't want to miss him. If he comes, I want to acknowledge him. I want to recognize him. I want him to do what he's come to do. So what, what do water walkers do? They get out of the boat. In spite of the crashing waves, they get out of the boat. Instead of the, <clears throat> uh, looking at the gale force winds, they get out of the boat. Instead of looking at the situation you're in, you get out of the boat. Instead of re recognizing it's 4 o'clock in the morning, what am I going to do? You get out of the boat. Instead of looking at all your problems and putting them down on the list and looking at them and saying, how is God going to do it? You just get out of the boat. And Peter realizes, hey, Yeshua is inviting me to get out of this boat and it's going to be an adventure. Listen, you go home and tell your children. When she walks on the water, she's going to be able to tell her children, you know, 2000, I don't know, 20, walked on water. And the children are going to be like, huh? yeah, it's recorded. People know it. I don't want to make a big thing, but I thought you should know. 
your mother, Water Walker. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just telling you. Don't want to brag. But I made a choice. What would you choose? Water or boat? Really, what would you choose? See, the boat, if we look at the boat, what does the boat symbolize? The boat symbolizes safety, security, comfort, right? I mean, you're sitting there, yes, it's a storm, but you still have some something underneath you. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? You're not raging in the storm. I mean, it's coming over, but you got a boat. Come on. You got something to hold on to. You got to order, you know, <clears throat> get it going. And, you know, you, there's a seat in there. It might not be comfortable. It's, it's nice. It's my boat. It's, it's my safety. Or you have the water. Now, the water is rough, it's high, and it's windy. But I'd rather be in a boat than on the water because I'm not used to walking on water. I am used to sitting in a boat. If you want to walk on the water, what do you got to do? Very simple. What do you got to do? Get out of the boat. I'm going to pray. Don't pray. Get out of the boat. Now, I'm not against prayer, <laughs> but get out of the boat. Sometimes we spend a lot of time in prayer for no reason. And at the end of the time, when he said, get out of the boat, and then you pray, and he still said, <laughs> get out of the boat. Then you pray some more, and he's like, get out of the boat. Right? Get out of the boat. When? Like yesterday, get out of the boat. There is something, or I should say, someone inside of us that tells us there's more to life than sitting in a boat. I love my house, I love my kahila, but there's more to life than sitting on your chair right here. Hello? This is nice. <clears throat> this is great. This is the gathering, this is the refueling, this is empowerment, this is corporate worship, co corporate word, but the true adventure begins out there in a storm. Hopefully, <clears throat> there's no storm in here. I've been in church for a long time. There can be storms in here, but hopefully there's no storm in here. This is a place of safety. Though the walls keep the storms out. It's a time when he comes and loves on you and you love on him and you praise him and he inhabits the praise of his people and it's all great. But the power of this is that when you go out in the midst of a storm, you're water walkers. You were made for something more than merely avoiding failure. Let me avoid the failure. No, let me, let me be successful through that failure. I need to leave my comfort of routine existence, abandon myself to the high adventures of what? Following Yehovah, halakha. Six verbs. What was the first verb? Follow. Walk with me. Walk after me. David was a man after God's own heart, which means he followed after him. Where he went, Yeshua said, I don't do anything but the Father says. So where he tells me to go, I go. That's how we should be, isn't it? So we have to ask ourselves, <clears throat> what's your boat? What's your boat? Whatever represents safety and security to you, apart from Yehovah himself, is your boat. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's your house. Maybe it's your car. It could be your children. Oh, I can't do this because of my children. I can't do this because of my money. I can't do this because of my house. I can't do this because of my job. I can't do this because, 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 because. That's your boat. That's your boat. Whatever you are tempted to put your trust in, that's your boat. Whatever keeps you so comfortable that you don't want to give it up, even if it's stopping you from joining Yeshua in the water, that's your boat. Coat. It's my boat. He might ask you, <clears throat> run around the church. When? Now, with people in it? Yeah, but I don't run. Exactly. Run. Shout. I don't shout. I'm very quiet. Yeah, but shout. When? 
Now there's people. I said, shout, shout. <laughs> my boat is my safety. I'm uncomfortable, right? Your boat is whatever pulls you away from the high adventure of extreme discipleship. Whatever pulls you away. Let me walk on water. Let me go to Ghana. Never been. Let me go to Ghana. You go where? I'll go there too. But when we do, I'll go. Pitch a tent. Is there a Hilton? I'll go. <laughs> small steps, just small steps. I'm close, I'm close, but small steps. See, it's either all or nothing, right? Isn't that what Yeshua said? It's either all or nothing. <clears throat> you either do it or you don't do it. You either follow me or you won't follow me. It's not your choice to decide how far you will. You either have to do it all or nothing. And if you're not willing to give all of it, then, then listen, count the cost. And when you count the cost, and if you're not willing to do it, then just stay there. Until you're ready. Until you're ready to step out, just stay there because you're just going to enjoy your little boat and your little boat ride, and the storm's going to take you around, but you're still going to be secure in the boat when in reality you could have gotten out and walked on water. And even if you fail and sink, it's okay. At least you walked on water once. You want to know what your boat is? It's very simple. Your fear will tell you. Whatever you are afraid of, that is your boat. You have to ask yourself the question, what is it that most produces fear in me? Especially when I'm thinking of leaving it behind and stepping out in faith. That is the boat. That is your safety. That is your security. <clears throat> and that is what's going to hold you in instead of getting out of the boat and be a water walker. I don't want my fear to stop me. I cannot allow my fear to hinder me. Listen, my life is, uh, you know, I tell my congregation all the time I'm going to live to 120, so that means I'm middle age right now. So I'm going to be turning 57. I know you all thought I was 20. But um, <clears throat> it would have been a great time for you to say, yes, I did. You didn't teach them very well. Add another hour. Pull out my other sermon. I want to be able to, if I'm going to lay down my life at the end of my day, to look into the eyes of Yeshua and say, yeah, I'm ready. I have done every adventure I can think of. I have gotten out of the boat so many times I cannot even imagine, and I have conquered every fear that is in my life. And I, if I could, I would stay for another hundred. Because this life was great. <clears throat> We're so busy saying, oh, so come. I hope so Yeshua comes today. Why? Tomorrow could be the day you get out of the boat. Right? See, whatever we fear, <clears throat> whatever, whatever produces fear in us, especially when we think of leaving it behind, maybe it's our vocation. Maybe it's time to change something. No, I don't want to change this thing. I mean, 20 years in a typical Christian church, that's a, that's a good stay. And then you want me to change everything? I mean, that means, you know, Pastor, Pastor Kenny, we have all my, you know, I'm sorry you do, but all my sermons from the very beginning, you know, on cassette. That's how old I am. Now all the young people, what is a cassette? <clears throat> I have them on cassette. So Pastor Kenny, we're cleaning out. Pastor Kenny comes and says, uh, should we just throw away these cassettes? I was like, what? My life? Who I was? Well, yeah. I was like, I will have to give them to my children if I die. And my grand, he was like, are you kidding me? I was like, I am not kidding you. And sometimes that vocation or what we have is so a security in us that we can't give it up. Maybe it's relationship. Maybe we have a relationship, <clears throat> whether it's right or whether it's wrong. You know, <clears throat> I'm not talking about unequally yoked, even though that would be a bad thing, correct? That would be something you could give up. But even if you are equally yoked, but it's not what Yehovah wants. Hey, I want you to walk away from that. My boat. My security. Something you have in secret that no one else knows. Maybe a parent or maybe 
just striving for such success and you're on a track for such success and he's asking you to get out of the boat. I don't know what it is because I only know what it is for me. I don't know what it is for you. And I do know that my boat sometimes keeps me in my boat. I'm here to tell you, right? Because there's something about security. There's something about <clears throat> being stationed and safe. But there's something spectacular about getting out of the boat. See, when you stand before Yeshua at the end of your life, will you remember the day a carpenter's son passed by you and asked you to risk the whole thing of your life? Hey, Peter, what did Yeshua say? Follow me. Hey, John, follow me. Hey, Matthew, follow me. There wasn't a plan. There wasn't an itinerary. You know, where am I going? This is what I'm leaving. Where am I going? In three years, how do you see me? <laughs> Will I be closer? Do I have a position? What's going on? Do I get paid? Is this a paying thing? Because I am leaving my fishing. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm leaving my wife, but that's not such a bad thing. But I am leaving my fishing thing. <laughs> Maybe the trade-off, I'm not quite sure. No. Follow. Hey, Abraham, you want the promise? Descendants? Then leave what you have and follow me. Where are we going? I'll tell you. I need to know. Mm -mm, get out of your boat. Get out of your boat. Hey, y'all want a promised land? Then put some blood on the doorpost and follow me. And some made it the whole way because they kept getting out of their boat and some wanted to get back in their boat and they died in the wilderness. I don't want to die in my boat. What wild ride does Jehovah have in store for you and you're still in the boat and want wilder? What is your boat? We must, and I'm emphasizing that, we must walk on water. We're living in a day and age where they need to see a people who can walk on water. We can't be the same as everyone else. We have to be a people who walk on water. We have to be a people who follow the master. And if he walks on water, we walk on water. If he raises the dead, we raise the dead. If he heals the sick, we heal the sick. Water walkers accept fear as a price of growth. I'm not quite sure I fear. That's good. It's a price of growth. No one steps out without fear. Going from singlehood to, to marriage, there's fear, right? Going from a couple to having children. If you don't have fear, you will have fear. When they start coming, you will have fear, right? To raise them up in a society like today, <clears throat> to train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he won't depart. When he gets whiskers, he won't depart. There's some fear to that because the world has such uh, claws out there to grab your children. <clears throat> Not... Not, I mean, worse today than 20 years ago and then 40 years ago. The choices and the avenues that they can go down. There has to be some trembling, some fear. Work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. He is not only, <clears throat> that, that scripture, I can't remember where it is, but it says not only the love of God, but the severity of him. Recognize them both. There's going to be fear because there's a price to growth. And the choice to follow Yeshua is a choice to grow. That's it. Out of the 12, who chose to grow that day? Peter. And he got out. And then he got looking around and he started to sink. But guess what? He grew. And the other 11 did not. Disciples get into the boat. They face the storm. They see water walker and they are afraid. And what does Peter do? He girds up his loins and he asked permission, let me go overboard. How many ever asked God, let me go overboard? And he sees the wind, and he's afraid all over again. But here's the deep truth. Fear will never go away. If you think you'll wake up one morning and never have fear, it's not going to be happening. The only way you'll wake up and never have fear is when you wake up and stop growing. That's when fear stops. I don't want. I want to continue to walk. Because each time I want to grow, 
It involves going into new territory, and new territory is scary. It, 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 it has to do with taking on new challenges, and new challenges are scary. We've been going to Africa for 25 years. The first time I went to Africa, scared out of my brain. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what they're going to do to me. Right? Now, it's kind of easy to go where we're going. But two years ago, we were all supposed to go to Benin, travel to Benin, and then something happened, we couldn't go to Benin. Then the preacher came and said, please, you, come to Benin. I was like, without my group? Yes, please, come to Benin. I was like, well, I mean, without my group? Yes, you, please, come to Benin. I was like, like, like when? He's like, like, like at 4 o'clock in the morning. Please. I was like, what? And Pastor Kenny was like, don't go. <laughs> and in front of the other team, I wouldn't go. And I'm in the bed struggling. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll go. Pastor Kenny, that's stupid. He's my voice. He's my voice of my wife when my wife's not there because she would have said the same thing. <laughs> You're stupid. And then he would, she would have said, why didn't you listen to Pastor Kenny? What is your problem? I get in a car. We travel, me and him alone. Have to cross borders, one border, two borders, three borders, four borders. And I will have to tell you, I've been going there for 20-some years. And with each border passing, my heart skipped a little beat. Every, oh. Like, oh. And he said, start praying. He is my shepherd. He is my rod. He is my shepherd. He never left me or forsake me, right? Hello? We went into a territory that was full of witchcraft and full of uh, demonic powers. I never got sick one time in, in Ghana in 25 years, but on that trip, I could even hardly stand the minister. I was just so sick. I was just pushing through it, pushing through it. And <clears throat> then I'd go back to the hotel room all by my lonesome in a little room, the door with no lock. Waiting. <laughs> Waiting. Trying to sleep with one eye. Trusting this is my trust eye. <laughs> this is my fear eye. <laughs> Finally got home. But I should have been a seasoned traveler. Because if I'm going to grow, see, what was I used to is I always used to having someone. A, a group, a team, a people, right? <clears throat> that you encourage one another and stand with one another. And now what happened to me? What did God do? Get out of your boat. Get out of the boat uh, called your team. Get out of the boat called your team who watches over you, who carries your Bible, who makes sure everything's fine, who protects you. Get out of the boat. Let me walk with you. Let me take care of you. Get out of the boat. And people around me wouldn't go. Even one of the pastors of... Uh, <clears throat> that I've known for 20 years who's African. I said, yeah, I wouldn't go. <laughs> and I'm African, I wouldn't go. <laughs> That's encouraging. <laughs> You're like, oh, you wouldn't? And when I get home, I wouldn't have went. That was God. I was like, it was God. I had to get out of the boat. So we're always growing. The only time you stop fear is when you stop growing. The decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. Which one will I choose? Let's face it, we do like comfort, right? You're sitting in comfort right now. Listen, we have a nice big building, it's a metal building, and when the air conditioner goes out, you get to see who really loves your whole life. Because now the air is not flowing. Now the heat is just, you know, coming down and we're sweating like anything. And you see people. <laughs> In this century, we should have air conditioning. <laughs> but can you still worship them? This means that to be a follower of Yeshua, you have to renounce comfort as the ultimate value of your life. Does he like you to have comfort? Does he mind that you have comfort now? I'm glad I drove here in a car. I'm not a horse and buggy. I'm thankful. He didn't tell me to start last week so you could walk because he wants me to experience walking. No. Get in a car, that's nice. That's comfort. But if I value that, 
over getting out of the boat, then that's a problem. Then my car becomes a problem. Then my house becomes a problem. <clears throat> then my relationships become a problem. Then my spouse becomes a problem. Then my children become a problem. We want comfort. We want the best-selling lazy boy chair we can get, the best comfortable couch and wonderful seats like that. I grew up in Church of the Brethren. I remember hard wooden pews. Anyone remember that? You lean to the left till that bone hurt, and you lean to the right till that bone hurt, <laughs> and you lean forward. Then you made a mess and did some funny things so your mama would send you out. You were so thankful when you were sent out. You never were bad until that moment because you need to get out. You can either be a water walker or a boat potato. Which one do you want to be? Eleven disciples. Let me wrap this up. What time is it? Yeah, let me wrap it up. We're coming down to the two-hour mark. I'm, I'm kidding. That's not two hours. Some of you just got back in your boat and started <laughs> rolling as fast as <laughs> Eleven disciples. They didn't mind watching, but they didn't want to actually do anything. We, we are spectators a lot of times. I tell you what, Pastor, that worship was good. I'm telling you what. It was good because you were just what? Watching it. Sister got blessed. Oh, did you see brother? He got blessed. You see who was at the altar? Yeah. Were you at the altar? No, I was watching who's at the altar. Sister was waving her hands. Were you waving her hands? No, I was watching sister wave her hands. Why don't you get involved? Because... A boat potato kind of lets back and watches everything. But when that boat potato watches everything, they not only see what's good, but they're also focusing on what's bad. As church people, Kahila people, we want some of the comfort associated with spirituality, but we don't want the risk and challenge that go along with actually following the Messiah. Just enough of God to make us feel good. Just enough worship to say, whoo, we worship. But I guarantee if we were still worshiping, we start from here to here to here to here to here to here to a bathroom break to the car got called somewhere. It's hard to endure because we're so used to what? Comfort. Right? Yeshua is still looking for people who will get out of the boat, and every time you resist that voice, guess what happens to that voice? Every time you resist it, what happens to it? It gets smaller, 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 smaller. Did Peter need to be rescued? Yes. Did his faith waver? Yes. But what were the other eleven? Sitting in a boat. He's the only one that took the chance. Rather take the chance and fail than never to take the chance at all. The worst failure is not to sink in the waves. The worst failure is to never get out of the boat. That's the worst failure. Peter puts himself in a position to fail. Have you ever put your possession, put your position that you can fail? Or do you just always make sure that you're safe in a position just to kind of be comfortable? I want to focus on this next slide. Failure does not shape you, but it's the way that you respond to failure that shapes you. How are you responding? Some of us will never respond to it for the simple reason we never put ourselves in a place that we can fail. We seek comfort. So what do we have? We have a call to get out of the boat. And let me tell you what that involves. Crisis. Opportunity. Often failure, generally fear, sometimes suffering, and it's always too big for us. That's what it means. But there is no other way to grow and no other person to partner with other than Yehovah. We live in a world that we think if you step out, everything is going to be fine. Everything's going to be kosher. Everything's going to be wonderful. No. Waves are still there. 
storm is still there. And from time to time, you might sink. But the one who bids you to come will be the one who picks you up. And he will ask you again, another time to come out of the boat. And another time, come out of the boat. And another time, come out of the boat. Maybe there was a time in your heart where your heart was like Peter. And you said to him, command me. You know, I've had ebbs and flows in my life, and sometimes I'm hot. Sometimes I'm not so hot. I'm a preacher. Can we not be honest? I'm like you, right? There's sometimes I'm like, this sermon's going to work. I like this sermon. And there's sometimes I'm excited this sermon's over. <laughs> I wish I could have cut it short. And I, for the life of me, don't understand why I kept it going. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just like, ride a home, ride a pony, ride a pony. Stop. Just stop. Just say amen. Just say, the Ruach said I'm finished. Because in reality, I am finished. And then there's some sermons you just preach, and you're like, this is good. Oh, this is good. You just want to preach forever. And sometimes the ones I think are bad, people say that was the best sermon. And sometimes the things, ones I think are good, people are like, just hang me. Just kill me right now. <laughs> was there a time in your life, and sometimes it happens when you're younger, because when you get a little older, you know, I like going, I don't know whether you agree with it or like it, but I like going to places like Bush Gardens and King's Dominion. I like riding rides. I like thrills of a roller coaster, okay? But I also recognize the thrill of a roller coaster when I get off is different than when I was 17. <laughs> Takes me a little longer to get out of the roller coaster. Takes me a little longer for my legs to start working after I get off the roller coaster. Takes my heart a little longer to stop beating, right? The bumping and back and forth I feel at 56 that I didn't feel at 18. You get off at 18, you're like, do it again. You get off at 56. That was good. That's enough. That was, <laughs> that was good. And you have grandchildren, let's do it again. Mm, let's try other one. Let's, <laughs> we want to spread ourselves out in the park. We don't want to spend too much time in one spot. Because you, now you have wisdom. You know what I'm saying? That little pony ride over there that goes around, let's try that one. I'm telling you, it is a thrill a minute. <laughs> sometimes you get out. Sometimes you sink. Sometimes you're sore. Sometimes you make it. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you hit a target. Sometimes you miss it completely. But you live a life on the edge of faith. So maybe you're sitting here and you haven't been out of the boat for a while. I don't know. Maybe you just haven't been out of the boat for a while. You've got caught up in life. You got caught up in what goes on with life. And so you settled in. You got your, your fishing gear. You got your padded uh, seat in there. And your thermos, your food. Everything is good. And the waves are just, you know, it's nice. So when God comes, you don't really want to step out too much. I even heard people say, well, it's time to hand it down to the younger people. Hand what down? Until you've done something, what are you handing down? They need to still see you get out of the boat. What are you handing down? How to sit? <laughs> How to stand there and praise and worship and not worship? Is that what you're handing down? You're doing a great job. I'm not talking to you personally. Just don't, don't. You're like, now he's defending me. I'm not, I'm not talking about you all. <clears throat> I'm talking in general. I've only been here one time, so I cannot make any judgments, even though, no. Just kidding. That was going to be a bad joke. My God, I got you in trouble, too. But What are you passing down? What your children should see, that during praise and worship, you are the worshiper. It is the most, it is the most er er radical worship that they could ever see. <clears throat> that it's time to praise, you are the praiser. When it's time at the altar, you are the, one, you are the first one at the altar. You are the last one at the altar. That's what you're passing down that you are on the edge of faith, <clears throat> that you're not afraid to step out. Because if you're always in the boat, they will always want to be in the boat with you. You have a very nice boat. It's nice, it's padded. But what if this morning your hoe is passing by? 
maybe the whole sermon is that he just wants you to reevaluate where you're sitting and get up and listen to him say, come and take a chance. Just get out of the boat. Yeshua is looking for people who will just obey him. Six verbs. What was the first one? Follow. Because the rest of them will not manifest unless you do the first one. You don't need to study all six until you get number one down. And number one leads to two. And two will lead to three. Three lead to four. Four leads to five. And then five leads to six where you are clinging to him. And by the time you hit the last one, the last verb, you know who you are. And your identity is there. And that's how you start to live. I want to live as water walkers. I want to get out of the boat, even in the midst of problems. I want to get out of the boat, even when the storm is raging. I want to get out of the boat, even if my faith is not perfect. I want to get out of the boat, even if I have to risk everything and possibility of failure. Let me be someone who gets out of the boat. But if I get out, if I get out, two things will happen. And let me close with these. Number one, you will fail sometimes. So forget about it, trying to be perfect every time. You will fail sometimes, but Yeshua will be there to do what? Pick you up. You will not fail alone, and he's still able to save. You'll fail. I've failed. Pastors failed. You all have failed. In every area of your life, you probably failed. In relationships, you said something you shouldn't have said, you failed, right? You did something you, didn't, you shouldn't have done, you failed. You made a decision you shouldn't have made, you failed. You went left, you should have went right, you failed. You went left and right, and you should have stayed. That's life, right? And that doesn't scare him. He didn't say to Peter, don't get out of the boat unless you're sure you can stand on water. He just said one little word. Come. Let's see what you got. Come. Let's see what you can do. Wow. You stood for five minutes. That's great. Because 11 of them are still sitting. The second thing, every once in a while, even if you fail, you're going to walk on water. And that moment is the most exciting moment. That moment of success, that moment of victory is worth every moment of fear and failure that you ever went through. That moment when it worked. So where are we in relation to Yeshua these days? Are you huddled in your boat with a life preserver, seatbelt on, enduring the wind and the storm, hoping it will soon pass and you get to the other side? One leg in, maybe, one leg out, or you're just water walkers, and you're loving it. I'm getting out. I'm going to walk. Let me give you a quote. Theodore Roosevelt. Anyone know him? It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena who, at best, knows in the end the triumph of great achievement, and who, at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those cold, timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. This is what Yehovah wants for your life. Victory or defeat, just follow me. And sometimes... We'll run into someone and we'll raise the dead and sometimes we'll be in the garden when swords are coming after us. Your church victory. I'll prophesy that to you. It's not even a, you know, ooh, he's prophesying. I prophesy to you. Your church of victory. Your church of water walkers. Some of you know it and some of you don't know it. You just need someone to remind you. I'm here to remind you. Storm will still be there whether you're walking on water or in a boat, right? The waves were the same. And Yeshua was there for each one. He's there on the water staring at the boat, and he's also on the water waiting for someone to come out. The only difference is your decision. 
And that decision is come. Get out of the boat and experience something that Yehovah wants you. My advice to you, to find that comfort, that safety, that boat, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Tear it apart. Rip it from, uh, from piece to piece, from front to back, side to side. Just get rid of it. Because God has some extraordinary adventures awaiting for you. If you want it. If not, ride it. You'll still be called a disciple. You just won't be the one who walked on water. I want to be the one who walked on water. Amen? Let's stand before him. Yehoah, I come before you with uh, gratefulness and <clears throat> humility to thank and praise you. Father, for your love for us, for what you've called us to do. I also know, Father, that you want them to understand the difference between a water walker, a boat potato, victory, defeat, extraordinary things. And Father, for whoever this word was for, whether it was for the word corporately as a body or whether it's for individuals, pierce our heart. Pierce our heart and let that arrow pierce into that boat of safety, security. That we might see it and we might destroy it. That we might be what you want us to be. Water walkers. I give you praise for your word. Thank you for your Torah and how it is relevant for us today. I thank you, Lord, that you've called us to follow you and we will follow you to the ends of the earth. With every adventure you put in our lives, we are willing to work through the calling and the fear of our life to be successful in what you've called us to do. Anoint this church greater than you've ever had. Let this, from this moment on, be a, a moment for this church to, to sense and to feel greater adventures, even in the midst of the storms that are coming. And let them be able to walk on water as they yield their life to you. I just want to ask you if you yourself feel that I've been sitting in the boat too long and I really need to change that venue. I need to change my perspective. I want to pray for you today. I'm not asking everyone to come, but if you really feel that you are in a place of security and safety and that that is stopping you from moving forward, I want you to come and just spread out here so we can just anoint you. you do an outrageous thing. Do you mind? Anyone mind? I'm going to ask you to remove your shoes and your socks. I'm just going to anoint your feet so that they might be water walkers. I can anoint your head, I can anoint your hands. And I will just tell you, I've never anointed just people's feet to set an altar. I've never done it. But I feel that, you know, sometimes our hand, I want to do it, my brain, I want to do it, but what stops you? I'm going to set your feet free today. I'm going to set your feet free that you'll no longer be satisfied with your toe in the water. You'll no longer be satisfied with the wave. You will look for every opportunity when Jehovah comes by. You're like, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Let me get out. Let me get out. Let me get out. Let me get out. Amen. Now I'm just going to take the oil and put it on you. I'm not, you know, in case you're worried, I'm not going to touch your feet. I know people, people are different today saying there it's what it is i want everyone that's in the congregation if you would just stretch forth your hands let's just pray and actually everyone that's standing here grab the hand of your neighbor because you know what now you're in agreement that each of you will be water walkers and i want you to encourage everyone have you walked on water today let that be your mantra maybe for this coming year shabbat shalom have you walked on water this week shabbat shalom as you pass you by as he beckoned you to come. Just a reminder, not for condemnation, not for guilt, just to walk on water, but to encourage you, you are a water walker. You are a water walker. It's time. It's time. Great things are about ready to happen. Great things have happened, but greater things are happening right now. But with greater things come greater storms. Greater waves. And we'll only 
take water walkers to see it through. And the water walkers, even though the 11 didn't get out of the boat, the 11 had an example. And there's going to be people in this church who are not ready to walk on water, but when they watch it, when they see it, going to start from the left. We're just going to sprinkle some water on you, some oil on your feet. And uh, as that oil hits your feet, I want you just to proclaim, let my feet now, let my soul, my spirit be a water walker. I'm destroying my boat and I'm walking on water. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have a prayer line, we just begin to pray in tongues. them see you pass by and and father welcome you father and and call out your name and walk father lord among the storm and the, and the sea and the raging waves father lord i thank you lord god oh let that saturate within them 